Oops. What's up, everyone? Welcome. Thursday night underwriting call. It's been a minute. We've missed this uh, call for the last three weeks because of conferences and things like that. But I'm glad to be back. And, you know, I know there's so many different things going on today. There's I think people are just leaving the conference. Hey. People are just leaving, um, you know, the pitch your deal, all sorts of stuff happening. There's other calls happening. So thank you guys for being here. Um, you know, the past couple of weeks, I've been moving my calls back into teaching fundamentals, going back to the beginning of, you know, I think it's a good cycle, right? It's a good cycle that we start from the, from the beginning again for anybody that is, Hey, Allie, welcome. Um, so we may or may not go into deep underwriting today. However, I would like to talk about how do we even start? How do we analyze markets? You know, I think it's really important for us to really understand that real estate is a shell. Okay. So real estate is a shell. The market itself, every market has a pulse. And how do we determine this pulse is what I want our conversations to be today. How do we determine if a market is a good market to invest into? Um, yeah, let's um, let's go into that. So I know some of you guys know some things. So I want to hear from you guys. Like, how do you know if a market is a good market to invest into? What do you look for when you yep. are analyzing a market? Did someone say something? Okay. So you can either unmute yourself and, and just share, or you can type in the chat. What I determines think, whether a market is good? You no, check. I think to look at is uh, <laughs> never works well, but you know, you want to see that you go in some place where people are moving to. You want to see that people are, it's, Population's growing and not getting worse. And okay. So, yes, definitely. One is population growth. Businesses work. People's work. Okay, so like, like, if their people jobs, are working, their employment. So is it if people are working or the types of jobs that are available? Alex, I look for a, a Starbucks, a Target. Uh, a McDonald's, they already did their research in the area. So they know the population, they know the density of it. Um, so they do the work for you. If they're close in your vicinity to where you want to buy, that would be a go for me. And then also I would look at median prices for the homes in the area. How much are they selling for? And then I would go on apartments.com and then look at the rents mm -hmm. and see what they're at. Yeah, one of the <clears throat> indicators that you want to use for median income is uh, that rents should be no more than a third of the median income. Okay, so the median income should be three times what the average rents are going for over there. That's one way to identify. So yeah, that's a, that's a good one. And also Starbucks and Target, yes, those are good and it's not always true. Right. right. Somebody was telling me about this market that had like 5,000 people living there and there was two Starbucks in there. <laughs> so maybe Starbucks is expanding or, or uh, exploring, you know, I don't maybe Starbucks goes there and then people go there. Right. Because everybody thinks that it's good to invest around the Starbucks or, or to live around one. So maybe. And then a, a quick matrix I would use is. Let's say my rent, I'm charging 2000 a month. I would times it by 40. So I would know that whoever's renting has to make at least $80,000 a year to afford $2,000 rent. It's just a quick way to figure out if they could handle the rent. Yeah. Good call. Good one. Who else? Who else has got some? Dwight, you were going to share something? I was going to share already got shared, but I was going to add to that. I think that um, uh, like the number of class A buildings in the area, that could be a good mm -hmm. indicator. 
Okay. Yeah. So new builds, new, new builds, nice amenities. That could be one for sure. What else? When we look at a market, come on, Ryan, you know, you know, some of this stuff. Political yeah, landscape. So, important. Yeah, so I was, I, I, I was, I'm just, I'm leaving, you know, Grant Cardone's event. So I got to, you know, bring in some grant, grant, grant isms. So Let's one go. of the things that I know Grant looks for, yeah, he, I mean, Grant looks for, um, for their uh, barrier to entry. So like in Florida here, you've got the ocean as the Eastern uh, barrier, and then you've got the Everglades to the West. So you've got limitation with, you know, how much extra stuff or multifamily can be built. So when there's a barrier to entry like that, he really likes to invest in an area like that, especially when there's, you combine that with population growth. Like that's what's happening down here in South Florida. That's why you combine I mean, that dude, with population he's got, growth. Like he's got that's what's happening down here in South Florida. That's why yeah. you combine I mean, dude, that. I'm getting huge echo. I don't know what that is. Anyway, that does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, barrier to entry, it's huge. <laughs> Can you, are you still echoing? I don't, I don't hear yeah. the echo anymore. Yeah. So I'm just trying to think of any others. I mean, it really that, yeah, the other ones that were mentioned are really good. Um, um, the other thing is when there's it, the other nice thing is if, if there is, and I know Grant's even a little bit cautious about this because he always likes to say whenever, you know, there, you don't get anything for free, but if there's like incentives, um, uh, if there's tax incentives in an area, something like that, like that could be, a positive indicator that, you know, that, um, you know, that you could, you could do something in the area. I don't know. I'm just trying to think of what else. I think that's really it for me. Yeah. I'm, I'm tapped out. <laughs> that was quick. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so barrier to entry is, is big. So like, for example, Las Vegas, Nevada area or Florida, you can't really keep building outwards. Right. So like they got the swamps on one side and then they got the ocean on the other. There's limited amount of land. So, they're not going to be building. They're not going to be building into the swamps. I mean, maybe they will, but you know, Las Vegas is surrounded by federal managed land all around. You can't build out into it. So there's just this much space. Now, places like Texas, not that it's a bad market, but they can't, it's flat all the way across. You can build outwards, right? Like one community gets old, you can easily create another popping, really fire community. It's almost like a little market inside a market. You want to say something, Ryan? Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. The other thing is, 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 um, where there's, um, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, not tax. There's, um, oh man, where there's, uh, it. there's economic, um, incentive not incentive i said that one but there's another one my gosh there's i'll come back to it come back to me <laughs> <laughs> like opportunity zone like tax incentives yeah, no, no there's the other one was um if you can uh my gosh i yeah come back to me <laughs> <laughs> okay we'll come back to you so what what are some other things in which you look at a market and you say hmm yeah this is a good market to go invest into Okay. Well, I want to share. So here are some other ones that I have as well that I just kind of wrote down right before this call. But <clears throat> you, you want to know that a place that is populated has a diversity of employment. Okay. It's not like one company that basically sustains and supports the entire community. Right. I mean, Detroit have Ford that basically every single person, everybody, worked at the same place. So when something happens to that company, the entire, that market is going to come down. It's going to be strained. All right. So you want to look at, I think uh, Rock Cleave calls it like the one horse uh, or something like that, the one horse economy. <laughs> you want to have multiple big employers that are employing people in the area. So that's one, the diversity of employers. We talked about population growth. So these are some things that you guys might want to write down. You want to write this down because, good, good job, Jake. You want to write it down because as you go into looking at real estate deals, you want to type into Google, who are the employers in this area? 
you know, and every market has a sub market inside as well. So the more local you can understand a market, the more, um, the better you can underwrite and analyze a deal. All right. So diversity of employ employment employers. Um, the oh, other I know. Uh huh. You remember <laughs> the um, there, where there's where there's no like um, caps on the uh, on the rents. The government ah. sometimes uh, uh, puts caps on the rents in certain areas like California, and also when they're very unfavorable for landlords. A lot of times the are super you know, unfavorable for landlords, and that can you know, create a bit, at least Grant says a lot of times that, you know, that basically that could really disincentivize investment in a certain area. Yeah. You know, and as people become more sophisticated real estate investors, they will look to see if you have deals that are in areas that are landlord friendly because it's more risk when it's not. If you can't begin the eviction process five days, three, five, seven days after they don't pay their rents, then it is not a landlord friendly state, right? It's protecting the tenants. And if they protect the tenants, that's how you have, that's why you hear stories of people that I would call it like uh, landlord nightmares where people live in your property for like a whole year without paying you. And all you're doing for the whole year is stressing about how to remove these tenants. How do you do it? I mean, people end up paying the money to leave, right? So it's going to cost you money as well. So that that could be the case. Um, now, it's not always like that in, in every state. It's not always bad. It doesn't make it a bad investment, but you have to underwrite that into the deal, right? Instead of having in your turnover rate, you might want to throw more money into that expense column for your turnover rate. It's going to cost you more. So you add that in there. So yes, definitely landlord-friendly state. The next one is, somebody already said it, population growth. I think it's extremely important to first know how many people live in the, in the area, right? I, don't, I wouldn't look at a market that had less than, even a sub market, less than 70,000 people living there. Okay, I want, I want 70,000 people living there. And I want, if I look it up, I want to see a positive trend in the last 10 years in this area of population growth. Right. I think, um, you know, I read something somewhere and this stays, this sticks with me is you should see a 20 to 30% population growth in the last 15 years in an area. That's an indication of a solid growing market. Now, one of the things we have to know is that real estate goes in cycles. There are four different cycles really in which real estate goes through. And the first one is recovery. Okay, there's recovery. There's a recovering cycle uh, point, or I guess we can call it a season in the market. Then there's an expansion. There's an expansion of it, and then it goes into hyper supply. Builders get out of control and overbuild in an area. So you'll have hyper supply. And when hyper supply happens, then comes like the recession cycle. And these cycles can happen simultaneously in different markets or markets can have different cycles happening regardless what's going on in the U.S. economy. Right. So when we say we can't just put a blanket statement over all real estate, every market everywhere is trending downwards because that's not true either. There will be markets that are going into recession and other markets that are recovering and other markets are doing an expansion and other markets that you see are overbuilding. So the other indicator is to recognize how many units are coming online in the next one to three years. That's also something to know. Does the population growth demand this many new units coming up? So what you can look at is you can look at percentage of renters in this market, right? So if, there, if it's 40% renters in this market and there's a 10,000 units coming up, coming online, that should be 40% of how many people that are moving in. Like that's at least one simple indicator, right? So if, if there is, I don't know, 
25,000 people moving in and there's 10,000 units coming up. Okay, it's justified. But when you have the same amount or more units coming online than people moving in, like in Texas and Houston and in, in Dallas, there are, I think in Houston or in Dallas, they are Austin and Dallas, one of these Texas markets, there's like 36,000 units coming online in the next 24 months. So I don't know, maybe they can, maybe they can handle it. Right. So we want to know how many units are coming online in the next one to three years. And we also mentioned before the median income should be three times the average rents in that market. And median income, like if you look at um, like Justice Map, Justice Map is a, a tool that I use to kind of quickly look at what's the median income in markets. When you look at when you look up Las Vegas, you will see a market, but it will have sections. There will be a lot of different sections and ranges. You'll see what those little tiny sub markets inside the market, how they're doing. What's the median income in there? Right. Is is my property touching the high median income locations? Is it in one? You know, is it does it look it's a surrounded by one? If it's surrounded by one, these are all indicators that you can look at that maybe we will have some overflow from there that comes into ours and it can increase the the rents possible here. Anybody else, if anybody else can think of something, feel free to unmute and just share. Um, I think employment growth is also really important that there are companies coming in, there are businesses coming in to a market. We already said landlord friendly. I think also one, want, uh -huh. Go ahead. I think one to look out for is you don't want to be overly saturated, but at the same time, I don't think you want to be investing in a market that nobody whatsoever else is investing in. You know, I think if somebody's there, you know, if, if everybody's avoiding it, is there some some reason why? And so maybe not a deal killer, but something to look closely at, I think. Well, you definitely want to take a close look at it because when nobody is there, it also means there's opportunities for you. You know, so then you got to do even deeper understanding like, OK, yeah, what is it? Uh, just but this... investing in, you know, the ghetto of Detroit either. <laughs> so. So listen, a, a couple years ago, I mean, 10 years ago, there were buildings in Detroit going for like like 100 unit buildings going for like four hundred thousand dollars. That's like that's ridiculously cheap, right? That's that's crazy cheap. So now people have bought it and they've held it for this many years and they're worth like 10x that amount of money. So it's not always there's always an opportunity in every market, but these are key indicators. And if you really like a market, see, these are just over. They're kind of guidelines. They're not the truth. They're not like this is how you should. It's not the holy grail. Because if you know a market, that means other people don't know it as well because they're doing the research and they may not know what's coming. So you have that opportunity too. Now, the capital raising for that may be a little more challenging because nobody knows, right? So data is also outdated. When you take, when you take a lot of the data, it comes from census. Census is super really unreliable, right? You can take a look at it kind of just to get an idea, but it is oftentimes lagged a year, two years, three years behind. You know, so those, those data is not always up to date. Um, we, we said landlord friendly. The other one that I, I, I look at also is the supply of single family homes. I look at that because that tells me how hot a market is too. You know, um, Las Vegas right now has a two, uh, it was a, I think it was like a two week supply of properties available. I don't know how they measure how many weeks, but there's a two week supply. I'm like, that doesn't sound like very many. So I asked my friend who's a real estate agent here. And she's like, yeah, there's literally no inventory in the entire, all of Las Vegas. There's like 4,000 houses for sale. I'm like, oh, all right. What's it supposed to be at? She's like, I don't know, five times, 10 times that, you know, so I look at supply and demand too. These are all indicators for me. They're not, 
you know, I know the market. I know what's coming. Um, another one. Would that be a good indicator? The fact that there's a short supply of, of, of single family homes, because that means they have to rent. It's not that they have to rent. It's just it has there's a high demand for people coming here. That means it points to the migration of people moving into Las Vegas also being higher. People buying and investing and, and, and stuff, right? When the inventory, when supply is low, prices always come up as well. Like that's why the Vegas, Vegas, California, some of these places, their cap rates have not changed at all. Right? San Diego, you're still looking at a three and a half cap. That's why nobody can like buy anything. My buddy, Chris, who's, who's over there, he's like, yeah, every deal that we buy, we're not cash flowing day one. Like that's not their strategy over there. Their strategy is to add an ADU or two ADUs or something like that to increase the value of the property. And then they can do a refinance out afterwards. Right. So there's a lot of reliance on how the market is. It's a lot of speculation. Um, unemployment rate. We also want to look at the unemployment rate in the area. Any market should not have more than 2% over the na national average. Okay, national average. If it uh, Right now, I think, what is it? Anybody know the national average of unemployment rate? I'm going to guess somewhere in the threes. So if your unemployment rate in your market is 7%, something, that's another indicator. Okay, there's something going on here and you want to look deeper into it. And the other thing is you, you want to know your local market cap rate. What are properties trading at? Is it fluctuating? Do the brokers not know what the cap rates really are right now? You know what properties are trading at? Is it all over the place? Or is it 3.5%? And for those of you guys that don't understand what cap rates are, cap rates is really the amount of returns that you get based on the money you put down on the deal. Okay, so the higher the price of a property compared to its income, the lower the cap rate. Lower cap rate also indicates that the the market is really expensive the location is usually really good the asset itself is usually uh better quality you know maybe it's right by the beach maybe it's a brand new build those are all things that can cause the cap rates to be low in the area and people are paying that if people are paying that then it will stay there right ultimately it, cap rates is determined by what people are willing to pay so if it's three and a half cap and everybody's willing to go into it, negative cash flowing day one, and they're like, if we build an ADU, we increase the rents, then we're going to be at a five, six cap, and then we can positively, positive cash flow it. And then when we sell it at a three and a half cap, we're going to make money. Okay, so the lower the cap rates, the higher you can sell the property, the higher the cap rates, the lower the value of the property. That's a, that's a confusing, uh, it's confusing for a lot of people because my friend was like, well, don't you want properties that are at like seven, eight, nine, ten 10 cap? I'm like, no. Because if you find a property that has a 10 cap, I promise you it's not in the prime location of that market. It's probably going to need a lot of work. You know, the, the people living there is probably a lot of delinquencies as well. The management's going to be very intensive. And if you raise a hundred bucks on rents, get ready for them to leave. So that's, those are, that's, that's cap rates. Okay. And um, I mentioned earlier the different cycles in which real estate go through, right? The recovery, expansion, hyper supply and recession cycle. Every market goes through it. And, and it's, it's hard to identify. Um, it's hard to track these things, right? But it's even harder to try to time it. Because by the time that you see all the buildings being built, all the new stuff, it may, um, 
it may be already too late. It's can you get it before all of it happens? And that's why it's important to study a market for a period of time. That's why when you study your and every single place in the country, there is an opportunity to make money in real estate. You just got to know the market. You got to know the trends. You got to study it. Underwriting isn't just about what's happening right now, but the trend of where which which cycle is in is really important to know. Right. Oftentimes I've done really well in real estate and created really big returns on a lot of my deals because there are things that I spot that indicates the it's going from recovery to expansion. You know, you can look at what are the incentives that the city is giving? What are they doing with the infrastructure of the market? And another indicator for me is when artists start coming around because art seems to be the way they bring artists into a place and art brings people that like art, that like the experience of art, because usually a lot of that is just on the creative side. And as more people go there and start to live around it because it's hip, it's cool, it brings the market up and then it gets too expensive and people get priced out of there. And they go and find another hip market. So before Brooklyn became what Brooklyn was, right? Like if you knew that the Nets were going to move the team from New Jersey to Brooklyn before it happened, you would have made 100x on your investment, on your money. But once they did, once they, once they made it public that they were doing it, immediately all the pro- all the property value went up even when people catch wind of it cuz nobody's letting their property go at 100,000 when it could possibly be 300 they'll wait they'll wait it out and they'll hold because they know the nets are coming and so ha- what happened in that area also was art art and music became a thing lots of little Music concerts in Brooklyn brought all the artists over there. And in a very short time, you can't even buy there anymore. You can't even live there anymore because it's too expensive. So then where do all these people go? All the art people, right? People that are just kind of following art. They're like, oh, well, you know, I hear this is a good place to live. I hear I hear California has got a place in San Diego that's coming up like that. Let's go to the West Coast. You know, because people in art and in music, they're kind of not tied down either. They like travel and they'll go to different places. And th- and this is also part of that, like the phases that we go through as human beings, too. It's a certain dem- demographic, a certain age of people that move into that area to make it hip and cool. All right. So I've been investing in places like that. Newark, New Jersey was one. I, I was lucky, though. I was lucky that I was there. And I saw the come up before Whole Foods even went in when there was just some talks about Whole Foods possibly getting the bid to be in Newark, Amazon possibly getting the bid to be in Newark. That means Newark is actively, okay, pursuing to create change. I like that. That's an indicator for me there as well. You know, I'm like, wow. Newark told Whole Foods that we guarantee you profit in the first five years. If you don't, if you have a negative, if you don't profit, we will cover it and we will make you profitable. We will pay you tax incentives for Amazon. I think Amazon was like, you know, some crazy amount. Newark like over offered for Amazon to to come into Newark. Now, Amazon went somewhere else, but they offered it. Right? I think it was like some crazy billions of dollars in tax incentives. All right, so you can take a look at the opportunity zones are in different areas. What are their incentives? Are they incentivizing businesses to come in? Are they incentivizing multifamily apartment investors to come in? You know, there are opportunity zones that literally allow, if you invest into a property there, any capital gains that you make from this property you don't have to pay taxes on. That's a very aggressive opportunity zone incentive. All right, so these are all little things that, you know, 
these are nuggets, right? Like it took me many years to go through all the different cycles. I've been in real estate for like 18 years. I've studied it for even longer than that. So, and I've seen it and I've done it. I went and did the different things in the different markets and saw what I was able to do there. And then Lake Worth, Florida, that was another one. I was like, West Palm Beach is right here and uh, Delray Beach is here. And in between is this, the, the, the kind of the worst town, I guess, is Lake Worth. But there was all this art happening. They had like little art festivals that a little downtown area became super hip. And it's right there next to the beach too. All the towns along the beach gets nice. Like people are going to go to Del Rey. They're like, oh yeah, I live here and it's great. And then all of a sudden everything becomes too expensive. Somebody jacks the rent up by a thousand dollars a month. They're like, okay, well, why don't we just go to the next town over? And then they go up to like Boynton beach and then Boynton beach gets, gets hot. And then after that is Lake Worth. And then above that is West Palm. So they're not going to go anywhere. West Palm, uh, Lake Worth stuck in the middle. And there was art, lots of art, very mural stuff like that everywhere. I was like, ooh, I like this area. Bought into it, crazy returns. You know, and people that have seen me do my real estate in Lake Worth saw that. You know, they saw that I'm always ahead of the trend because of that. And this is what's important is to be ahead of the trend and buy and be willing to hold. Because if you try to time which cycle it's in, you will oftentimes miss the one that you're trying to get into and land on the one behind it. And then you overpay. And then there's an over, there's a hyper supply session. Sec, and then now you're fighting other landlords, other apartment building owners for the tenants. Because there's too many now. And everybody's pushing incentives and whatever for you to come and live here three months free rent i don't know i don't i don't know if there's ever such a thing but um you know at least a month they give you free rent for a month and for an apartment for a multifamily investor that hurts the bottom line and it hurts our investors okay take a pause right there what are you guys hearing what do you guys want to New sport franchise in there, definitely good. Yeah, there's like seven in Las Vegas. <laughs> and like three new ones coming. And I keep talking about Las Vegas because I want all of you guys to be witnesses in the next five years to be like, damn, Alex was talking about Las Vegas before that whole thing blew up. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, the thing about Las Vegas and everybody stays away from is the idea, their, their idea, people's ideas of Vegas. Oh, people just go there and get, get trash. It's just the casinos. It's just the strip. Everyone sees the Vegas. It's just the strip. That's it. But there are people living there. There's communities. There's all sorts of stuff popping and happening over there. And as they bring all these, like, family... Um, oriented things they bring sports teams sports teams create um mm -hmm. loyalty in a community and that keeps them in, in in the community as well you know like the 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 vegas raiders now like huge so many people are like huge loyal raiders fans in las vegas and they came from oakland Poor Oakland. I mean, is Oakland the place that you want to invest real in real estate right now when the Raiders just left and then now the Oakland A's, their MLB team, just bought a billion-dollar piece of land in Las Vegas and they're saying they're going to move here by 2026 or something like that? That is probably a recession market in Oakland while it's a expansion market in Las Vegas. Now, recession, toward, what now, so if you look at that, right, so there's probably going to be a lot of people moving out of the area, you know, all sorts of stuff will happen in Oakland because it's a huge, they employ a whole bunch of people too, all right? So all those people are going to be out of jobs. So not only did all the people that work in the Raiders stadium in the Raiders place now are out of a job, now it's the same thing in the Oakland A's. What's going to replace that? What is the city's plans to come back? 
because the city is definitely planning right now to figure out how to replace that. So you want to get attuned to it. If you, if that's your backyard, there's an opportunity there because after the recession phase is the recovery phase, the recovery phase. If you get in on the recovery phase, the recovery cycle, it's probably the most profitable time. If you get real estate during the recovery and then into the expansion, that's when you are going to make the most amount of money in real estate in that market. But if you buy it at the height of the expansion, right? If you're buying at the height of the expansion, so like, for example, I would say Las Solas. Las Solas expanded to as high as it gets in such a short time. Everybody probably missed out on buying there unless you were, you know, actively working with the city and rebuilding the place. You probably miss out and bought it during the height of the expansion. After the expansion phase, it goes into hyper supply because it's going to be too expensive for people to live there. And they're going to be like, let me move to Hollywood. Hollywood's doing all these things to build up their area now. And I'm talking about Florida, if anybody is, you know, with me here. If anybody doesn't know, Florida. So Hollywood is building up. And so people are moving to Hollywood because it's hip, it's cool. It started with the city's uh, creating of like the downtown area, making it really cool, giving incentives for these awesome businesses to be there, incentives to build nice hotels, nice buildings, things like that there for investors to go there. And now if you're in Las Olas, you're like, ah, you know, Hollywood's pretty cool. You know, we lived in Las Olas for a while. It was awesome. But how many years in a row can you live in a place that's just, bumping all the time <laughs> so then people move out of there because it's too expensive and then it becomes hyper supply because they overbuilt now now there's less people there and people moving out of there to the town next over and so this is why towns around a growing market is also really good they're called uh tertiary markets i think that's the term tertiary 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 something with a t a T market, okay? That's also good around the area. It doesn't have to be exactly right there. Like, you're not going to be buying anything on the strip in Las Vegas, but what's around it? What are they doing around it? The next place in the recovery, downtown Fremont Art District. Especially if they call something the Art District. Everyone's going to be like, what's that? And then they got parties, they got parades, they got all sorts of things bring people over there now. They're like, ooh, this is a cool place to hang. It's one-tenth the price to eat here than on the Strip. So, of course, we're going to get out of this area and move over to this area. And then you want to look at what, what's the city's incentives? What do they want to do here? The city wants to build dense population in this area. They don't want... So if they want dense population and you got all these little houses and small multifamilies... What's going to end up happening if you project and you can see it further down the road is that some big company builder is going to come and say, let's take these four smaller apartments and let's buy them out, right? Demo the whole thing. So they're not buying based on the cap rates or anything like that anymore. They're buying based on their projections of putting a 200 unit building there. It's probably a discount for them, even though they overpay you when you own a 30 unit building there, they'll overpay. They'll pay you double. They don't care because they're going to put a 200 unit building there and that's going to be, it's going to be a steal for them. It's not that much, you know, for the whole project to buy four lots next to each other in a great location and put a 200 unit building right here. Boom. They knock out four or five of these smaller, smallers. So that's another thing to look at, right? You always want to look at what the plans for the city are. So I'm in Vegas, so I can keep, I'm going to keep using Vegas examples because I do my studies here. I meet a whole ton of people here. I research. I'm always like trying to find out what's the scoop, right? So there's $2.5 billion that the city is committed to the infrastructure of Las Vegas in the next four or five years. That's the city's contribution. Now there are there's the MSG sphere that came that was two billion. 
There is the um, the the bullet train that just broke ground from Los, Los Angeles to Vegas. There's only four stops. Only four stops, Los Angeles to Vegas. That means people are going to be in and out of Vegas. It's going to be crazy. All right. And, and Mark Wahlberg's committed to making Las Vegas Hollywood 2.0. So what's going to happen is everybody's going to move and come from L.A. to Vegas. It could be a day trip. And then they hop on the train and go back. I don't know how long that train's going to take, but it's a $10 billion project. How many people are going to be employed also in there from Las Vegas? Crazy, crazy opportunities there. Oakland A's coming. Universal's coming. Hard Rock Casino is building their guitar hotel here. Um, Game of Thrones. Formula One signed a 10-year deal with Las Vegas. 10 years. And they want to do more than one race per year. And you know how much revenue one formula one one formula one race brings to the city like three to five billion dollars per race and i think the entire city generates like i don't know six or seven billion dollars a month something like that i don't know but one race boom does that they want to do multi multiple the super bowl is coming to vegas all the athletes already train here all the drafts already happen here. Everybody in the off season, all the athletes come to Las Vegas to train and play. So now you have all this stuff happening here. And then they bring the sports team here. I can't wait till they bring a basketball team here. That would be really exciting. And they're talking about it. A soccer team, basketball team. And um, what else is coming? Oh, the NFL also said, we will bring the Super Bowl to Vegas every four years if you guys can clean up all the, like the city more. <laughs> so what do you think is now, now the city's like, yeah, let's do it. You know, so that's why they're putting so much money. The city's investing so much money into, into the build. Opportunity zones, you know, really, really great here. What else? Um, so, yeah. I'll take a break here for a second. What are you guys hearing? Um, what other things do you look for in growth markets? Alex, it's your chinny. Hey. What, what did you say? Recovery, expansion, recession. What was the fourth one? Hmm. So after expansion, there's a point of oversupply or hypersupply. Oh, hypersupply. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, it's way more than that, Ali. I just named a couple things. There are multiple casinos that were just bought out and being completely redone. Those are each like a couple billion dollar jobs. You know, and I want to be somebody that also played my part in making an impact in what's happening in this market. I want to be like, look, I did that over there. We created this business. We brought X amount of people here. You know, because I know that I've brought probably five people to Las Vegas. So if everybody in Vegas brings five people to Las Vegas, this place would be out of control. Yeah, uh, um, Ali, I can actually, you know, Dwight's actually putting that together already. So we will provide that for you, hopefully by end of the week. All right. I've already got a couple things. I mean, uh, other, other things to look at in the market is taxes. Okay. I, okay. This is super important. I can't believe I totally forgot about this. Taxes, insurance, business incentives. Um, what else is there? Uh, interest rates, I guess, something like that. But property taxes and, and, and income tax and state income tax. Right? I know mine. Now, I have a deal. No, sorry. My deal is doing fine. But our partner has a deal. Okay. My partner has a deal in Texas. Okay. The deal is like kind of hurting right now. It's like upside down. Because insurance. Insurance went from $600 a door to $1,800 a door. 
Now that deal is 16 units. It can't handle that, but it's small. Now imagine it was 250 units that would destroy the operations of a property. Okay. From 1600 to $1,200, uh, 16, let's just say it's a 12, $1,300 increase a year. That means per month, you need to be able to raise rents by another hundred dollars. Okay, so 200 units. Let's just do the math real quick. Let's say you buy a property in a place like that. Okay, Oklahoma, Texas, Florida. And you're like, if I, oh, you know, I can increase the rents by a hundred bucks, 200 units, 200 units times a hundred bucks times 12 months. That's $240,000 in extra NOI. And, and for this property, let's just say it's a five cap rate. That's $4.8 million. You're super excited. Dude, we just made $4.8 million by increasing the rents by 100 bucks. Insurance goes up by, by $1,200. That wipes that entire $4.8 million out. Everything that you just did to increase the value of that property just got wiped out. Now, let's say you didn't even get to raising 100 bucks yet. You're kind of cash flowing. You're about to go into doing that. Then you go in the opposite direction. Boom. Did you see the deal from Massive Capital and Forth? Uh, yeah, it's the Amberwood. So, you know, it's, I don't know. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really in it right now. I'm doing my own thing. Um, and I don't really want to be in Texas for that, for, for that reason right now. Right? Taxes. Like everybody's trying to fight taxes, fight insurance. The dude that got $250 million worth of deals foreclosed on is because of that. Interest rates went up. They asked for more reserves. Now you're, you're already eating into any profits, any reserves that you possibly have. You're already negative. Okay. And then they increase insurance and taxes. There is no light at the end of the tunnel on, that de on those deals anymore. You would need to increase rents by like three, four, five hundred dollars $500 just to make ends meet, just to kind of start back to, at ground zero, right? Those deals got foreclosed on. And when they get foreclosed on, okay, a deal that's $200 million requires maybe anywhere between 75 to $100 million right? Of capital raised, right? Those deals probably got foreclosed on and they lost majority of their money. Their down payment's gone. The down payment, when you lose a property, if you buy a property at 20% down payment, okay? When you get foreclosed on, they're paying, they're taking it at a discount, more than 20%. That means the money you put down is gone. And back in 07, 08, everything went into foreclosure because people didn't even have 20% down. They could care less. It's like, yeah, I'm not going to deal with this. I didn't have that much money in it anyways. Take it, foreclose it, foreclose on it. And then just massive foreclosures everywhere. You know, so I think that's one thing to, to consider is what are the property taxes and the insurance looking like over there? All right now, Vegas is extremely low on both. But I hear Vegas also has a little bit of insurance um, increase coming because of the all the brand new builds that are, that are here. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't see it. You know, I haven't seen it. But either way, we have a 30-unit property that has a $7,000 a year uh, property tax and like $8,000, maybe even less. Let me, let me just look real quick what the insurance is. Just so I can, you know, say some say the accurate thing. Wait. Okay. Eleven thousand dollars for insurance. I had a three hundred forty-five thousand dollar property in Lake Worth, Florida that had higher taxes than that, than a 30 unit here in Vegas. One property. <laughs> A single family house had higher taxes than 30 units, right? So those are things to consider. Opportunities. If I buy something here in Florida versus buying in Las Vegas, the opportunity cost is 29 units. 
29 units. So you can go, and this is why what we're doing now is extremely forward moving for the country. Everybody has an opportunity to be able to invest outside your market. And people are beginning to understand this because there's a lot of calls like these that are educating people. I love it. Okay, some people are like, oh, there's too many calls. Well, great. This is part of the mass education that gets to happen. Everybody is taking it upon themselves to become a teacher. Good. Go out there, become a teacher, post on social media, do all these things. Now, what I believe is going to happen, which is what I've been telling people also, is like a lot of us are also showing people how to move their IRA money from your traditional index, mutual, whatever, into real estate. Now, how much money do you think is being moved across the country like that? What do you think is going to happen in the stock market when, this, when billions of dollars leave it? and go into real estate, all right? This, I would say, if you're looking at cycles, probably on the expansion side for real estate and probably on a recession side for stocks, all right? And what, what happened today? There was some crazy, somebody sent me something that the market took a, took a nosedive today. Yeah, only about 4% of the IRAs are self-directed. That means it's gonna, that number is going to get higher. It's going to grow, right? Like I think I've done, I referred at least 30 people myself. And I know other people are referring people. And these custodians are busy as hell, right? I, I went from one custodian to another to another because they're just getting too busy. They're getting flooded with people trying to move IRA to self-directed and then into a real estate deal. That's happening across the board in the whole country. There's a multifamily trend that's happening. Now, I don't know where in the cycle it is, right, for multifamily. I believe there will be some time where hyper supply of people doing multifamilies will, will, will be a problem. And... Then we then at around that time will be a great time also to buy, which seems like it's kind of happening right now. 13 trillion in IRA. Okay, so even if we took five percent of that out of there from the market, from the stock market, that is going to hurt the market tremendously. I think I the, today somebody sent me something and it said the Dow dropped like 300 points or something. And they had to freeze trading multiple times because of how volatile it was getting. There's companies losing 60% of their shares in a matter of hours. Right? Like These things are going to happen fast. They're going to happen fast, and you are not going to be able to time anything. That's why you want to look at things in the long term. When I look at these, I want to enter a market. I want to enter a deal during the recovery expansion period. I do, maybe towards the very end of recession. I'm not that brave to be able to weather that. You know, I don't really want to do that, but I'm willing to go in at a certain pace because it go, the cycle goes like this. It's like a circle, right? But it's always going up. So the recession now is still higher than the expansion five, six years ago or 10 years ago. So it's, it's fine. That's why if you look at and you buy things and you hold it for long-term, it's fine to go through these cycles. When, the, when it's in the re expansion cycle, that's when you sell or you refi, right? When, you, when it's in the recession cycle, recovery cycle, that's when you buy more stuff. And you can buy it in any part of the cycle as long as the numbers make sense and you plan out 5, 10, 15 years for your purchase. And you will be happy. Now, if you buy at the height of right when it's turning into hyper supply and everything's going to come crashing down, it will take some time for the circle to come back around to be above where you, you entered at. So I'm sharing with you guys all my knowledge, what I've learned with different mentors and what people are saying, and I get to do my own critical thinking around it. 
And I'm sharing that with you. So I, I, I invite you guys to also do your own critical thinking around what I'm saying. Does it make sense? See, this is the thing that everyone needs to understand. You can't just go in and just listen to things and believe that's fact. Does it make sense? Right? Last year, we had a 4.2% uh, interest, on, uh, interest only fixed debt for 10 years. They tempted us with a 3.4% adjustable. We'll give you 3.4% if you take this. I'm like, uh, it sounds good, but no thanks. You know, like, I want to get this deal. I want it to stay how it is. I want it to be, cons I want it to be reliable. I want to be able to rely on what's going on in the deal. You know, I want to know what all of it, what the expenses, I don't want it to be adjustable. Because at 3.4%, I don't see it adjusting down. <laughs> it's only going to come up. So logic, right? But now, if you didn't have logic and you were just doing what everyone else is doing, then you may take the lower one. You may be like, okay, let's take the lower because it's adjustable. It gives us the flexibility to exit, right? It gives us the, the, the flexibility to exit in two, three years. And we can tell our investors, we're going to do all of this, increase this, do a refi, give you a huge return. If that's not the way for people to get into trouble, and we don't learn this from history, that is, that's just your own, that's just people's own arrogance and not wanting to learn from history. I do believe what's happening in our world as information travels faster and faster, things will happen faster. It will be harder for you to time anything. Harder and harder to time. You got to just be able to say, you know, this deal makes sense. It underwrites, it works. I'm buying it now. I do not care where it is in the cycle. As long as the location is great, it's positive cash flowing, you know, you believe in it, you can get good debt, get the deal now. The, the whole like, oh, let's wait till the next, at the end of the year. Like, dude, I promise you ain't nobody going to catch the bottom. And if you caught the bottom, it's because you're in a deal right now. And it's going to take you three, four months to get the deal closed. And you might just happen to land at a time where they're like, ooh, interest rates are super low right now. Or something's happening right now. So I wouldn't time it. Okay, there's a lot of talks of timing things out right now. That's my personal opinion. Take it how you will. Um, think, does it make sense to you? If it makes sense, cool. Right. And also use time to help you determine if it makes sense or not. Questions, thoughts. Hmm. Okay. What else? What else? What else? If you want to underwrite any deals, like feel free to also, you know, respond to the email, text back the text message that you get like, hey, I got a deal that I want to look at. I got a market that I'm looking at. You know, can we can we talk about it? And maybe we'll bring it up onto this call. And we'll bring it up on a Thursday and we'll talk about a couple of deals. We'll talk about a market, something like that. And we'll use that for educational purpose. All right. So yeah, that's that's my that's my spiel for the for the night. Um anything I can help anybody with? So recapping. Let's recap. Know the pulse of the market. Okay, real estate has a pulse. The deal and the market has a pulse. The deals itself are the shells of what's of, of you know the market. Just because you buy a great deal, if it doesn't follow all these other things, then it may not work. All right? It could be a good looking deal. Everything could look great with it. May not may still not work. 
All right. So for anybody watching live on Facebook or wherever you're watching from, feel free to, you know, um, join us in next Thursday's call. And yeah, so real quick also, oh yeah. Hey, Muhammad. Oh, hey, thanks. Uh, so quick question. So I was looking at it. It actually is that the apartment that I am living in right now. It's a 106 unit apartment. It's pretty good, like class A building. So I was thinking like, but I talked to them and uh, uh, it's like for sale. And they're saying that there is a hard loan associated with it. So is it good, bad? Well, like, I, I don't know how to like, uh, Get that out. Like, is hard loan is a good thing because uh, we cannot do uh, secondary uh, secondary financing or mortgage on that because there is a hard loan of forty years. So, what's your take on that, please? So, the, let me just. So, what I'm hearing is they have a like a debt for you to assume. Yes. Okay, so they have loan for you to assume, which is a good option for people right now because what it does is it gives you the opportunity to get in at a lower interest rate than where we're at now and, right, you know, ri for, and ride it out. Now, 40 years, okay, it seems like 40 years is like a HUD loan type of loan. So you're talking yes. about apartment complex, right? Yes. All right, so HUD loans, do some research on it. A, it's pretty hard to qualify because anything that is government, inter has government intervention, they have way stricter regulations, rules, things like that. Now, I think HUD loans, you can only distribute money to your investors like once or twice a year, something like that. So right. that's, that's something to consider as well. Now, if they have 40 years left, they probably already been paying for like 10 years, something like that. Um, you know, when you assume a loan, what ends up happening is, yeah, you're going to have to put more money up. Exactly. So yeah. it's basically, uh, the down payment, like they are asking like 50% and 50% is the hard loan, but the other 50% has to be like uh, capital raise or, or like down payment. So yeah. have you ever seen a case where it made sense to you? Yeah. The deal we have right now, we're assuming it and we're putting 50% up. Um, but a cash flows, it's in a really great location. It's not a HUD loan. It's just a regular Freddie loan. So, okay. you know, Freddie loans are not 40 years. I don't even want to know what, a, what the penalty is to exit a deal that is a 40 year loan early. <laughs> right. You, the pre penalty, right. There is a pre penalty of 9%. Not 9%. Holy shit. Yeah. So, 9% <laughs> is stupid. Okay. 9% is crazy. Okay. Wait, this is one thing I want to actually share with you guys about what types of loans you should be getting right now. So there is two different types of prepayment penalties called one is called a step down. The other one is called yield maintenance. Okay. So step down looks like you have a five-year loan and the first year, if you prepay it back in the first year, you have a 5% penalty. And then the second year it's 4%. Then the third year is 3%. The fourth year is 2%. The fifth year is, a is 1%. Now that's called a step down. The other one is called yield maintenance, which is uh, yield maintenance is depending on if the bank can make more money off of letting you get out. So like, let's say the interest rates that you got in at was at 3%, right? It's at 3% and you do yield maintenance. That means when you want to get out, interest rates at the, the market time could, could be higher. It's probably most likely going to be higher. It'll be 5 6%. That means the bank can make more money by actually getting rid of your loan so your prepayment penalty is actually much lower. Now, if you go in right now in today's market and get a new loan, okay, that is uh, 6 7 8%, whatever it is that you get, do not get yield maintenance loans because if you get yield maintenance loans in the future, the interest rates will probably be lower and then your prepayment penalty will be higher. Does that make sense? This is as clear as I can possibly explain yield maintenance and step down. So when interest rates are high, you want to get step down um, prepayment penalties. Most 
fixed debt will have prepayment penalty. It's the adjustable ones that will give you more flexibility. And that's why it was an, it was it was very uh, tempting for a lot of people to get because see, there's a cycle of investment expectations. Okay, when people are when the times are tough right now, people will be willing to put into deals that may not even cash flow as long as my capital is protected, I have tax write-offs and you know and and it's a hedge against inflation and the stock market. I just want my money to be safe. Right? Our expectations as investors come down during this time, which is awesome. It comes down, so now you you have but there's people are going to be more scared to invest. But the expectations come down and you can make deals work. Now, when things were really great and everybody was making all sorts of money, the expectation became, I want a 2X in three years. I want a 2X in two years. And the only way for syndicators to try to get those investors is to try to find deals that they can project like that. Now, when you try to meet those and you don't have solid fundamentals, what's going to happen is you're going to get into trouble, which is exactly what's happening today, right? A lot of people getting into trouble. Because, and it's not really their fault. It's kind of like, here's the demand. The demand was for this. And here is what we supplied. And then this happened. So these things, these things happen. Um, so for your deal, I think, A, I would just kind of avoid HUD loans as a whole. You know, because you have to, for, for you, I would say you need to identify who are the people that are going to invest money with you. Because HUD loan type of deals is a strategy to buy something. It is. It's very right. low interest rates. It's for very long time. It's very secure, very safe. It does, it's not volatile with what's going on in the market. Okay, those are usually much, much bigger deals, right? Nice properties, things like that, class A buildings. Right. Yeah, because it's large. When you have a large deal that is class A, you're going to overpay for it. And the only way you can overpay for it is if you have low interest rates. So hence the HUD loan. Now, when you assume and you buy this thing and you put 50% up for a loan like that, A, when you exit, when that 40 years is up, okay, interest rates will probably be higher. It will probably be higher, but 40 years later, it doesn't really matter. You probably already made so much money and so much equity off of that. Just from inflation alone, the building's going to go from, you know, whatever, 50 million to like 300 million. So at that right. point, 40 years down the road, you probably don't care. But do you have investors that's like, yeah, sure. I want to, I want to put my, my money into a deal that's 40 years, 40 years. There might, it is a strategy. Right? Like if I have a whole bunch of money and I just want to make sure it's secure, I put it in a really great asset. It's going to cash flow. I don't expect any two X's in three years, five years, nothing. I just want the consistent cash flow and I want my capital to be protected. And 40 years later, my children will get a big check as well. All right. So that's, that's kind of the strategy. Now, is that your investor base? I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. Um, I see. yeah. So you got to really just identify who is, who are your investors, right? Okay. Like right Thank now, you. yeah, right now my investors are like friends and family and people that I know and people that I meet here on these calls. This is my avatar right now, but it's starting to change. It's starting to change into, um, accredited investors. As I meet more people that have money, have capital. You know, they're, they're surrounded by people with capital. As I enter those circles, as I learn how to build up my investor database, you know, as I have deals that are larger, I'm going to have to move into the accredited investor 506C type of deals, which my investor base will change. And I will start to, you know, I will start to, uh, that's going to be my new avatar. Like right now it's friends and family and stuff. And I, and I love it because I get to bring people along with me. If I just jump right into deals and I take, and I skip ahead and I go right into the 506 C's, I will not learn all the things I'm learning right now. 
I won't be able to give the opportunity to my friends and family that aren't accredited. You know, so right, right. yeah, that, I would just say, learn, know that now yeah. our, our deal, right. We are assuming a loan that is 4.4% fixed for seven years. Um, uh, so it still cash flows. We are not over leveraged, which means, so if you put 50% down and your deal can cash flow, when you refinance, you also will recapture. Like if your leverage goes down, if they give you 75% LTV instead of your 50% that you had down, you're going to get money out. So another example, real quick, um, our storage deal, we put 50% down, seller financing. Okay, 50% down on the deal. We've already increased the income on this property. We've already uh, put crushed uh, gravel down, more parking spaces. The value of the property has increased drastically already. Now we're going to go do CapEx. Usually when you do construction loans, okay, you're going to have to um, figure out what the carrying cost is going to be, right? You're gonna, there's a carrying cost in which you're doing construction and you got to carry the interest of that loan in that period because it's not really going to generate income when you're doing construction. Okay, so there's carrying costs. Now, because we have 50% leveraged and then the cons new construction loan is a 75% LTV of your finished product, by getting the construction loan, we are getting around six dollars $700,000 back. And then we finish the construction loan and then we're going to go and, and lease it up and, you know, get it up. And uh, we will refinance out the entire amount that the investors put in. Because then we'll get a fixed debt, we'll get lower and it'll be more long term. So it's, you know, there's you just got to know, like, what what does your plan look like down the road? Like if I was to put 50% down on a property, what am I going to do with it? I have extra equity sitting in there that technically doesn't have to be there. But what's the game plan down the road? You know, who's going to, who's going to, what, what's my, like, am I going to refinance? What am I doing? Like, how am I going to increase the value of the property? When am I going to refinance into another loan? Or is my investors just cool with, because if you put 50% down, your cash flow is probably going to be lower too because you require, you put more money and more investors need to get paid. Investors are the most expensive. Right, right, right. right. See, your deals, your deals, you're offering investors 17%, 20% returns a year. There is no loan that costs that much. Actually, no, I do know some loans that cost that much. Okay, those, those really short-term temporary loans that they give you at 5% a month, they're more expensive. But hard money loan, 11%, 12 12%, right? Like preferred equity, 8 to 12%. That is all cheaper than an investor. So your investor is going to cost you the most money if you put 50% down, so the cash flow is going to be less, right? Like the deal that we're buying right now, if I was to get a new loan, we may only have to put 35%, 30% down because it's still cash flows. It meets the DSCR and we can do that. And the cash flow will be higher. Um, but our interest rates are going to be higher. And so then maybe our cash flow won't be as high. So I don't, you know, when you play it, that's why you have, that's why, you know, we'll do an underwriting exercise, maybe on the next call or something. If somebody reminds me to look at the two scenarios, or we can pull up a sheet, do a scenario where we put 50% down at assuming the loan. And then we'll do another scenario in which we acquire a new loan. We do this on every single one of our deals. Okay. Right. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Okay. Good question though. Great and, question. Sure. Thank you. And just last, uh, just a last question uh, related to that is, so if there is a hard loan, so can you partially finance the rest of it or there is no secondary uh, mortgage you, uh, possible for the, when there is a hard loan associated? 
I think you can. I don't. I I think you can get a second somebody in the second position, but I would say you would need to ask the lender. You know, do you allow a second position? And if you do, will somebody that's will preferred equity come in? Because if they come in, they're not going to want to stick around for forty years. So then you got to figure out again what's the what's the play. Right, we'll pay you preferred, so we raise less money now, but we have a second raise that will that will pay you back your capital. That might be something that you would discuss with preferred equity, because I don't think preferred equity is going to cut you a big check and be like, "Yeah, we'll hang out with you here for forty years." They're not doing that. <laughs> right, but 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 since it's cash flowing, I can I can probably come to an uh, agreement with them. Uh, Every year, I'm gonna pay you this much because this property is cash flowing. It's like a million a month. Uh, sorry, million a, uh, a year. So, and probably in five years, it should be 1.5 projected. So you can get 70% of it every year, and and that's how you're gonna uh, have your money back over the time, over 10 years or whatever. So, is that something like viable? Something I have you seen before? Um, so preferred equity, most of the times they, they want to, they're, they're basically in it for that cash flow too. They're in it so that they can put their $10 million somewhere and get 7% guaranteed first position returns, you know, above the investors. Now they're going to ask for 7% at least in their pref returns, seven to 12. Can your deal support that? You know, I don't think a class a deal will support seven to 12%. So now you're going to owe the preferred, you're going to have to owe the family office or whoever brings up that pref equity, right? The money, then they're probably going to in the contract tell you that they are going to be in control if they don't get their money. So then you'll lose control of the deal and they'll say, well, we want to sell right now. And then you'll, you, you won't even be able to say, no, I don't want to take the 9% prepayment because they will get their money back. They don't really care about your investor's money, right? So right, those, are the, right. those are the different traps that you also want to consider when going into that. Right, got yeah. it, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, that's very, very good question. High level, sophisticated question. I hope everybody followed along with that. All right. Well, we got another like five minutes here. If anybody wants to ask another question, clarify anything, you know, any other questions you may have with whatever you're up to. Great. Well, next time I'm going to have to say in the, from the beginning of the call, write your questions down as we're talking. Formulate questions, get engaged. That's how you learn better and faster. Uh, just a quick question since uh, we have time. So you, uh, are you working, uh, uh, actively working on any deal uh, that we can be part of? Uh, who's we? I mean, yeah, there is definitely, we have an opportunity here in Las Vegas and we have a couple in the pipeline that is, just waiting for this deal to finish. Okay, so how I, uh, if I'm interested, how, how I can learn more about those opportunities and the deal that you are uh, planning to close in the near future? Okay, I am going to send you a Calendly invite and you just uh, put your time in here that you want to chat. Okay, and and... You know, I'm not going to put it publicly, everybody, just because right now I'm I'm holding out my calendar space just for investors right now. Um, so I'm not do, I'm not packing my calendar up. But if you're interested in the deal or if you're interested in learning more about, you know, real estate, you can always email me or respond to the text message number that you receive. That's one way to just kind of start chatting with me too. Or DM me on in Instagram. Instagram is probably the fastest way, which my 
Instagram thing is right there. Handle. Yeah. Cool. So I look forward to chatting with you. Do I, do we know each other? Okay. Thank you. Uh, we met at the grand recent summit at uh, Miami, Florida. At the where? Uh, Miami, Florida grand summit. Oh, okay. Summit oh yeah. Yeah. Days. Okay. Great. Okay. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, let's set up a time to chat. So I send it to you in the chat in here and in the zoom and I hope that we talk soon. Sure. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Well, this was a great, I had a great time. I hope you guys did too, you know, and I'm glad that after three weeks, you guys still made it back here. <laughs> appreciate, appreciate the support, appreciate, you know, your time. And, um, yeah, I'm glad to share. I'm glad to share any knowledge that I gain along the way. And I'm always in, you know, I'm in Grant's real estate club. I hear things that he says. I'm in Robert Martinez's. I'm in Rock Cleef's, you know, and I, and I have these high level conversations with people that are big in the game, you know, like Brad Sumrock and I were talking about real estate as well. And, um, yeah, mainly he's trying to get me to bring everybody to his conference, <laughs> which I will go. Okay, his AmnatCon, I will be going. So I will get you guys the cheapest tickets possible for everybody that is on my, uh, in my community, on my email list. That's always, that's always something that I strive to do is to get the cheapest tickets from every event to everybody. All right. Well, it's been real. Happy Thursday. Hope you guys have a fantastic weekend and, um, you know, reach out if you want to do something in the Las Vegas market. Mm. All right. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you. Good night. All good right. Night. Good night, Thanks, everybody. Alex. Bye, guys. Peace out.